that's not the right kind of stealing. The right kind of steal is like taking a bit from different sources, you know, like uh, that's always the key, you know, it's not so much of drinking from one source. It's more about drinking from different sources and combine everything plus your own thing. Well, hello and welcome to the Leverage 3 podcast. This is the show that helps you leverage the talent and tactics of high performers. I'm Craig Shoemaker and today's guest is Alex Yuyi. Alex helps you grow your creator business by stealing tactics from top creators. Alex, welcome to the show. Hey, Craig. Thanks so much for, for hiring me and for the invitation. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you. I think that your, your branding, your approach, your story is, is fun and compelling all at the same time. So why don't you start us off by telling us, like, how did, how did all this come about? Like, tell me a little bit about your story. Yeah, so like a bit of my background, I come from advertising. So my background is in advertising agencies. I used to work on advertising agencies up until 2020. Then we, we all know what happened in, in 2020, you know, big <laughs> pandemic. And I was working at that time, I was working at a, at a big media agency, we could call it. Actually, Vice Media, you know, that oh, yeah. uh, got, it went bankrupt uh, a, few, a few months back. <laughs> so, you know, no surprise, actually. And that was like... I would say March, April, 2020, they, they said they decided to close like the, the regional offices where I was working that was based, I was based in Madrid in Spain and they decided to close our office plus the Barcelona one. So like, I guess, I think it was like 60 or something people, we got all, you know, fired mm. on the spot, you know, at, at that time it didn't feel really well, but it was actually the, you know, like the, I, I always say like the kick in the butt that I needed to actually start doing my own thing. Right. And that's, that's more or less at the same time when I started. I found Twitter and I started tweeting about everything that I learned during like my uh, agency days and, and all of that. And that slowly started to build an audience, but it was like super slow. And I was getting basically like zero results. I mean, I was having fun in the platform, but results weren't coming until I actually started paying more attention to the creators I was, I, I was following at the time. And I was like, you know, what are these people doing that I am not doing that I, 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 can, I can apply for myself? And at that time, I was reading uh, the Still Like an Artist book, a uh, re really good book, like I highly recommend it. And that's, that's kind of when it clicked. And I was like, you know, when, what I'm actually doing is like stealing from these other creators and seeing what they do. I'm just stealing it from myself and applying it to my own content. And it's kind of working, you know, that, that was the time that my, my, my Twitter audience started to grow. Well, I, I should say X audience right now, no, because we are like in the middle of the <laughs> other rebranding. That's when I started to grow. And I, that's when I realized, you know, like the way to operate is not so much about trying to figure your, you know, everything by yourself. It's more like observing what others do and then just stealing bits, a bit from here, a bit from here, and then combining that with your own expertise. And that's, you know, for me, it's like the formula of success with, with content, but with, with business too, you know? So that's how the whole steel thingy uh, came about. And I, ju I just decided to brand myself and all, all that and I do with the steel thing because I thought it was fun. And a, a way to differentiate myself. So right. yeah, that's, that's how it all uh, came together. Hey, do you want to get parts of these interviews that aren't available anywhere else? Well, you can join the Leverage 3 email list and get access to exclusive content just for subscribers. So go on over to leverage3podcast.com and sign up today. Yeah, I love it. it. It is a ton of fun and it gives you a lot of character and, and it makes the point. Right. So when you're talking about stealing things from people, obviously you're not talking about stealing and repackaging your ideas. You're talking about something kind of different, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's more about, I like to say more like as an inspiration, you know, I like to think about it as taking just inspiration from others. And that's the, the problem is that there is like a fine line between like some people, when you say stealing, they don't really understand it. You know, they think it's a bit, you know, uh, oh, what's happening here? You know, they, they, they put themselves on the, on the defense. And when I say stealing is everything is rooted in inspiration and in the good kind of stealing, you know, like not, I'm, we don't copy paste content from, from people, you know, we don't steal images. That's not the right kind of stealing. The right kind of steal is like taking a bit from different sources, you know, like uh, that's always the right. key, you know, it's not so much of drinking from one source. It's more about drinking from different sources and combine everything plus your own thing. You know, that, that's where the right stealing and the right, the cool mix happens, you know, because that's when you are creating something you need by doing that. Right. So you, you've been going through this process. You've been using this practice, not just for the last few years, but your whole time during your, your agency uh, work. And 
Is there anything that sticks out to you as being like among one of the most surprising things that you've learned from someone else that you've been able to steal and incorporate into your own business that had like the highest impact? Yeah, I would say like one one is probably like content repurposing. I wasn't really familiar with content repurposing. And once I started observing how the top creators operate on the on the content uh, part, it's so easy to spot how, when they are reversing content and so on, you know, once you pay attention. But before I wasn't doing that, and now I do it all the time. And for example, if we talk about, and I actually just, I, I have it top of mind because I just did the research like two days ago. I was looking at Justin Wells, you know, like really well-known content creator on Twitter, LinkedIn and, and whatnot. And he does one thing that's super smart and basically is... He, he puts a piece of content and then for every piece of content that he puts out, he has like some sort of a database and then he puts them all there. And then from there, he picks the, let's say like the, the hits. And then he just takes that tweet or that LinkedIn post and basically copy pastes it and, re- and reschedules them for like three, six, 12 months uh, from now. And basically he just, after like one year or two years, he's just playing the best hits all the time, you know? <laughs> and that's something that he does, but... A bunch of other creators do too. And I think it's a, right. it's a good thing to do because first you are like kind of optimizing your content creation time. You know, you're not investing that much, that much time into creating original content. But at the same time, uh, it's good because in six months from now, you're going to have a different audience. You know, you probably, your audience probably has grown. So they haven't been exposed to your past mm-hmm. ideas, you know, so it's a way to, you know, put your past ideas in, in front of your new, uh, new audience. But at the same time, it's a way to, reinforce those ideas for your current audience, you know? So I think, in my opinion, it's like a win-win-win for everyone. That's one of the tactics. And, you know, since I've been doing that, I spend less time creating content, but I still can leverage, you know, my past pieces. Right. So I think I think it's something that every creator should yeah. do. Yeah, there's a whole art and science to that in being able to look at your metrics, figure out what the high performers are, and then take those and, you know, repackage them. I think, you know, you probably change the hook, maybe the lead a little bit or, or something like that and go on from there. So let's dive into a little bit on, on, on metrics. So have you found or uncovered from different people, like what sort of metrics they're looking at, how they're using data? What direction can you give us there? Yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a big fan of creating content like data-based content. Uh, because the num- numbers never lie, right? So uh, people do, people, <laughs> people lie, but numbers don't. So one thing I like to pay attention to, especially like on Twitter, there is this metric, uh, you, you know, you have the likes, you have the reposts called retweets before, now it's reposts. Uh, and then you have the profile clicks. And for me, that's the most interesting metric because it means that when someone saw your piece of content, they took the time to visit your profile and check your profile, you know, and, and that, that means time, you know, and when someone invests their time into your thing, I, I think that's a good signal, uh, signal. So, you know what? What I usually try to look at the profile clicks as one of the main metrics, um, just to because I think it signals it signals like a highest level of interest. Uh, that and replies for sure. You know, those are the two engagement mm-hmm. metrics that people often don't look that much at. People often focus more on like likes and shares and that kind of stuff. But I prefer to look at replies, the good type of replies. You know, like good engagement and profile clicks. Sure. Because both signal like right. h- high interest from the audience. Well, I think profile clicks is is interesting, and I agree with you. I don't think it gets spoken about enough. In that, it's it's likely a signal from people who are new to you. Yeah. Because if someone is following you, they know all your stuff. Like they're not necessarily gonna. They might look at your profile, but this is telling you here's people who are kind of fresh to your audience, fresh to your message, and and they're interested. And uh, yeah, I, I think that's a, a great signal. So. When you're when you're looking at that, are you just are you cross referencing that with like replies plus profile clicks, or do you like to just look at profile clicks? Okay, this content hit. Now let's go and double down on some of that stuff. Yeah, so so it's a mix because I also like to look at underperforming content just to see why why it hmm. failed. And because sometimes I think uh, you have the feeling, you know, and you say like this piece of content is good. It's just that maybe the framing or the packaging wasn't good enough, right? as you said. So. I try to repackage it again with a different hook, maybe, or a different framing or like moving, you know, with an image or whatever. You know, if, if you feel in your gut that that's a good piece of content, then that's also, that's something that I also try to do. Now, if I've tried it like maybe two times and it still uh, falls flat, then that's sort of like a signal that it's not going to work anyways. But at least, you know, trying to give a second chance, even not to your top content, but also like your underperforming content, I think it's something uh, 
smart and interesting to do because sometimes it's just about one sentence written differently and you have like a flop or you have like a viral post, you know, and it, it just takes that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So in terms of content creation, what other things have you learned from other people that you've uh, found that works well for you? Yeah. So probably one, one element, really important element is, uh, if you want to call it branding, like the branding part. Um, and for example, in my case, I had like the stealing thing, but I also have visually, I mean, when I say branding, I also mean like visually, like I do have mm -hmm. one, one color for my profile picture. I have one, the same color for my header on, on all social media. I also use the same color when, whenever I share an image, I, instead of sharing just the image, I try to share the image with like a color at the background. So everything gives like a, some sort of a brand, you know, brand vibe in a way, uh, because I, right. at the end of the day, I'm kind of building like a personal brand, you know, and that's the branding part sure. of the, of the personal. So yeah, that, that's what I try to do, you know, like colors and that, and that's something that it's super easy to do. You know, it's not something that takes too much effort, but the, the, the legitimacy and the credibility that you earn while doing it is super high, you know, in, in people's minds, I think, because, uh, often has happened to me that I see someone sending me a DM and saying like, Hey, you know, I build business. I can, I can grow your business from this to that and whatever. And then you check their profile and it's like a profile picture of a dog. And like the bio is about <laughs> like the New York Knicks and the latest picture, you know, like, uh, at the end of the day, sure. you, you need to think about that. If you are like, if you want to become a professional creator or you want to monetize what you do in some way, you do need to look professional. Uh, you know, like, mm -hmm. it's not like yeah. on my, prof on my personal profile, I wouldn't have all of these things. I do have them on my, prof my professional profile because I'm a professional. I like to think I, that I am one, you know, so that's, right. an, that's an element that helps with, with that too. Yeah. Okay. So there's so many different aspects to building a creator business. You've got content creation, you've got branding, you've got building email lists, you've got offers, services, all that kind of stuff. So why don't we kind of go through each of these different categories and you can, can give us some of the stuff that you've learned from other people and, and why it works well. So in, in terms of building an email list, yeah. what, what are some of your, your, your favorite tactics there? Yeah, so like building an email, email list is key, you know, because as we have seen, if you build on social media, you are, you are building on right. rented ground and we all, we are all, we all start there because it's easier to get the attention, but then we need to funnel that attention to somewhere that you own. And the best place to do that, in my opinion, is an email list. So definitely, um, be a big, it should be like a big focus for most creators. Um, so in my case, like some things that I observed that work super, super well are like, um, for example, when you have like a newsletter and you are going to be writing about X topic then teasing the topic a few days before or like one day before doing like a tease post in a way saying, Hey, tomorrow X amount of people, you know, are adding the social proof, they are going to learn about this topic or blah, 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 you know, join here to, if you want to hear it too, I see a bunch of creators do that. And I know for a fact from some of them that it works really, really well, uh, you know, to, to get more people into the email list. And then also like the tip, more typical tactics, but that, that they are also effective of mentioning it if you have like a post do especially well then mentioning it just under that post you know as a comment right. or as a reply or whatever and be like hey if you like this type of content just you know here you know in my email list i share more of this uh, you know it feels organic it's simple to do but it works you know you don't need to do like super crazy things to actually get people into your email list it's just like you can treat your social media in a way as like sharing snippets of what they can right. find inside and then have the the full thing and the big thing inside, you know, at, at least that's how I try to think about it. It's just social media is the teaser. If you want the full thing, you need to join my, right. my email right. list, you know? So when it comes to writing messages, I, I know there's so many different philosophies where long form, short form, give people mm -hmm. an excerpt and then have them go to your website. H have you found that there's either one of those and it's all context dependent. I, I get that, but let's say for you and, and your list, mm -hmm. what tends to work for, for you and in, in, in your approach? It, it, as you said, like it really, it really depends, but the, depending on the type of content or the type of goal that I want to achieve, you know, in the case of, if I wanted to get like, for example, business leads, you know, because I'm selling a service, then I would probably go more for the long, long form type of content because it's easier to build the trust and credibility and show your expertise mm -hmm. with a longer form piece of content, you know, and that's one thing that I observed too, that for creators that they have like a service based business. Um, the way they get the most high quality links, uh, leads, sorry, is not with 
like shorter piece of content and teasers and like these viral formats on Twitter is like with in-depth pieces where they mm-hmm. share their expertise in full. And that usually doesn't get that as many attention, as many likes, as many reposts or whatever. It gets more uh, DMs, you know, and DMs often lead like to a, to a, like a sales call or whatever. And that eventually leads to like a business lead, which is way more valuable than a retweet or like a like, right? So th- that's the big, big difference. You know, like I think if you, are, if you just want to get people into your email list, then sure mm-hmm. for com- content is probably the best. You know, just tease them. And try to get them in. But if you want to get like business leads, for example, I would go for long form content and go more in depth, you know, and on whatever you, you do and just be like super open with your right. expertise yeah. and your knowledge. So what, what are you learning about right now? What, what are you stealing at the moment? Yeah. So uh, right now I'm super mm-hmm. focused on like email marketing stuff. I was like a total n- newbie to that. And I was basically just using, I mean, I, I'm using ConvertKit for my email list. And I basically was just using it for sending emails. Which is, you know, one of the main things, but not the right. main, you know, you can do way more, you know. So now I'm, I'm starting to experiment more with like audience segmentation, trying to understand better who, who my audience uh, is, what, what are they more interested in and so on. And that kind of stuff, you know, I, I'm still like really early on that process, but it's, it's super fascinating and following people like, like Brennan, Brennan Dunn, I would say like he's one of the best, like top, top, top 10 email marketing experts in the world, probably. And he knows, like, just by reading his emails, uh, he, he sends, like, these really super long emails, you know, about, he goes super in-depth about email marketing, but th- they are super insightful. And he shows, like, how he segments his list and how he, you know, makes people click. And if you click this link, you know, you get to this page. And if you get to this page, you get this this email. But if you go to this other page, you get this other email. And it's just so crazy, the level of complexity. But at the same time, on a business mm-hmm. level, that works super, super well, you know, because you are, uh, the key here is, like, personalization you know you're talking to that person you are referencing their pain points you are talking about you're basically telling them what they, what they want to hear and when that happens like making a sale is way more easier than if you're just like shooting sure. like spreading yeah. your content all around without yeah. too much personalization so well, let's say with convert kit you've got uh, a form that you put out maybe you want someone to join a wait list for a product that you have or you, and then also with mm-hmm. that same list you have the ability to just have them join your, your general list. Like, so w- how are you segmenting people out? Like, is there a code that you put in the link that then puts that into the convert kit list or how does that work? Yeah. The, the easy way is just to have a survey right after they sign up and, you know, just start from there. I think there is there are a few software that they do that easily, or you can also have like a Google forms or right. something like way more simple, uh, simpler to do, or even with tax on, on convert kit, you can use the tax to like put, uh, people on different interests and right. so on. I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but that's that's how I that's how I would do it with a survey because that's uh, right after the sign up, especially because that's when their their interest right. is intent is at the highest. So it's easy for people to like, okay, let's take twenty yeah. seconds to do like this survey. You know, um, like uh, as another example, like for <clears> example, I I was I was I just went through like a, a launch process for for like a beta program that I'm working on. And my last email was actually to everyone who didn't join. And I asked them, why didn't you join? And I gave them five options. Each one was a link. And each option was like, I don't have enough money to pay for it. I don't have enough, enough time to take the program. Um, I don't trust <laughs> you to, to, you know, to, to, to do that for me. You know, that, or another one, I, I think it was like, I missed the deadline or something like that. I think those, those were some of the options. And I just needed to click. And that, you know, immediately tags them on my, on my, Right. You know, on my ConvertKit account and says, okay, these 50 people said that the problem was money. These other 50 people said that the problem was time. So now when I, when I go back to pitch the product again, I can write an email, especially de- dedicated to those 50 people. Like, okay, you said that you didn't have time. These are the reasons, like, you know, these are my, my way to, you know, sure. fight those objections, you know, and I can, my pitch right. can be way more personalized. Of, of course, it's more work, but I think it's better to try to, convince 50 people that I know, you know, what's the main concern that they have than just trying to shoot my pitch to, to yeah. everyone and just hope that they sign up, you know? So, uh, you know, that's, a, that's an insight that I actually that stole right? from Brandon <laughs> Dunn that I mentioned before. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. And it works. It, it kind of works, you know, I, I, and now I have more data about these, these people. And whenever I launch this product again, I will just try to, you know, make my pitch more focused for, for these people. So let's, let's dig into this launch a little bit because I, I think, this is where things get very real for people. You know, building a social media following, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying it's doable. 
Then you can bring yeah. people over in your email list. That is not easy, but it's doable. And then you get to this point where you're like, okay, I have an offer. I'm going to make my pitch. I'm going to put myself out there and you're not hoping because, you know, well, hopefully, you know, you're uh, very strategic uh, moves in order to make that happen. So t tell me a little bit about this launch. Like, what were you selling? And if you don't mind sharing, like, how did it go? Yeah, yeah, of course. So wh what I'm what I'm just launched is like a membership on top of my newsletter. So um, actually, this is our second month. So it's still like super early. Okay. I, I, we are in beta stage, I would say. Uh, so this pitch, this pitch hasn't even gone to like my full list yet. Um, it's just like a small segment that I have of people that have bought my products before, you know, so pre people who I know that potentially have more interest in what, whatever I have to say, you know, so I'm just pitching to that people that that's the first thing, you know, I'm segmenting a small right. segment of my audience that are more interested in, in my products. And then, um, basically what I did was put together, like, a, 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 let's say my idea was to make like a content membership. So you join you you have like two two workshops a month or something like that and then you have like a bit a few a bit more content all around like building an audience and monetizing your content and that's what happened for the first month but at the same time for every member that joined we had like i think it was 14 people join on that first batch let's say i i had a 30 minute call with each each one of them and i was asking them like why did you join you know i was trying to understand better like yeah. you know doing some proper audience research for people that joined and most of them told me that the actual reason that they joined is because they wanted to be surrounded by more creators mm. on their level. Because I, I did like specify that I was looking more for creators, not beginners, but not pros either. So yeah. a bit more like people in the middle, you know, sort of the middle. So that kind of, that message kind of resonated with some people. And they said that the reason that they joined wasn't the content. It was because they wanted to be surrounded by that, those type of people, and they wanted to do more things. So I actually, I took that information. I actually pivoted for this second month. Uh, of the membership and we switch it to a more like an action based uh, membership and right now we are what we are doing is like every month we pick a topic for example this month is like building a lead magnet and what we do is mm -hmm. we do like a sprint you know we have a kickoff session where I, I basically say okay this is what I will do to, to build the lead magnet these are the types of lead magnets that are out there and this is what I will do moving forward and then each week we have like one feedback session where we come together you know, we share with our progress and we get feedback from other members and so on. So it's like a way, it's like an excuse right, to build yeah. together with other creators. And since I did, I did that pitch on the second, because I'm opening, let's okay. say I'm opening the card once every month right. so for five or six days every month, because, you know, to, to, to fit with the sprint dates. So this second pitch has worked way better uh, in terms of conversion. I mean, not so much in terms of members, because we got like 10 members, I think, for the second batch. But the fit that these members have, like the, you know, the, the, how they fit with nice. the rest of the members is way, way, way higher. And the, I would say like the qual, like the qualities that I, I was looking for for them is like really, really high. So I'm super happy about it. And it all came from actually doing some, th taking 30 minutes with 14 different people, yeah. you know, like that, that's, that's a few hours of me just talking to people and trying to understand like, you know, why did you buy and so on. So right now it's not even like, I wouldn't say the product right. is finished at all. You know, we're still in beta, but I, I'm st I'm still having these conversations with these people, and I'm trying to gather as much data as possible from my target audience to make when when I do like a proper launch to make it like a success. You know, because I want for you know I'm yeah. taking their words and using it, using it on the copy and on the emails and, and all of that. You know, so yeah, that, that has been my approach, and I think it's kind of working right now. So I, I'm I'm happy about it. I love this method. I think it's, I mean, it, it's obviously not revolutionary or new, like people have been doing it over and over again, but many people skip this step. And so mm -hmm. you've had these seven hours of conversations with 14 different people. What questions were you asking them? What, and what were you trying to, to get at? Yeah. So the first one is like, why did you join? So just trying to understand why did you join? What, what, what compelled them to join? And the second one is like, what would this Mm -hmm. What would this make a success for you? Know what would what would it, if you have like a magic wand? You know what would being in this membership be a success? For, you know so and that's when they start the they started talking about like I need more accountability for the creators. You know I want to be surrounded by creators on my level. You know that kind of stuff. Isn't it? <laughs> right. So barely no one mentioned like I want to consume the best content in the world. You know it's not about that. <laughs> and you know that that in in a way I was like a bit hurt because I was like yeah you're not joining because of the content. Right. But then I realized that that's you know. It makes sense, you know, the world is full of content, you know, the information is out there already. 
if you want, you can just go right. on YouTube and on Twitter or whatever and find super high quality content for free. It's not that much about the content. It's about, you know, mm -hmm. finding a group of people to work together and, and, and that, and that's not that easy to find, you know, on the internet, unless you go into like a private thing, like, like we are doing. So yeah, that has been the, you know, the main, the, those two questions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think the thing that it also says is that they trust you in order mm -hmm. to build a community that has the quality of people that they're looking for. You're, yeah. you're like a collector of high caliber creators. <laughs> which which I think is is really cool. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's another element too, but and that was a bit surprising to me, but at the same time if I think about it, I'm like I've been publishing content and being online for the last probably 3 years, you know. So, it's mm -hmm. not if I did this on my first 2 months as a creator, you know, it, it would have been a, a you know total yeah. flop, you know. So right now I'm actually building on top of my reputation as a creator in a way. And people kind of trust that because, you know, I have been showing up for a long time and I would say that 60 or 70 percent of people that have joined are people that i know that they have interacted with me in some capacity and the rest are mm -hmm. people that have been in my list for a really long time you know very i, I guess right. i think there is only one guy that has joined um after just reading one email something like that the rest have been all because you know they have been exposed to me and my ideas for a very long time sure yeah that's awesome so out of those conversations I guess two things, what other patterns, you know, you, you, you said that they wanted to be around like-minded people at the same level. So what other patterns emerged and was there anything from those conversations that surprised you? Yeah. Just, just the fact that, uh, I, as what I mentioned before is that they, that they were not interested in like the content offer, which it was the main thing that I was trying to sell. You know, I was super big on that. It was just like the, <laughs> the, 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 how most of us as a creator, like for example, me, I work from home, right? So um, I do have conversations with mm -hmm. other creators on Twitter or I do have calls like you and, you and I met because we did like a 30 minute call from Twitter, you know, but th that's not the yeah. that's not the norm right. for every day. So, you know, being a creator sometimes is especially like a solopreneur type of creator. It's sometimes a bit lonely, you know, and I think that one thing that w most of us don't have is like an idea sparring partner in a way. And I, I, I do have, I have mm -hmm. met a few friends and uh, on Twitter that are creators like me. And when I share ideas with them, it just, you know, just talking about an idea helps, helps you so much with the clarity. Uh, and so, because sometimes you write, you write about it, you, you know, you post about it and all that, and it seems clear, but the real clarity comes when someone else kind of challenges that point of view <laughs> and say, Hey, you know, I don't understand this sentence right. or like, you know, I wouldn't do it this way, try to do it this other way. And that's where the real value is. And that's what I'm naturally trying to build with this membership, you know, that a sparring partner factor, if we want, if if we want to call it that, right? So, yeah. yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many times I've written something and I'll show it to somebody and they're like, I just, <laughs> I don't really know what yeah. you're getting at. Like, what is the yeah, point? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, so that that interaction is is mm. incredibly valuable. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so another aspect of email marketing is that process of getting the email to begin with. So talk to me about landing pages and conversions. Like what have you learned in, in, in that regard? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because lately I, I have been experimenting with my, my own landing page. And before I used to have like, um, I, used, I still have it. It's my main page. Like if you go to the, the steelclub.com, it's like my main page. It's like you have the subscription box, but then you have a, a top bar with like blog, whatever. And then you, if you scroll down, you have like, Three different links to go to different articles and then you have like a, a footer and all that so the problem with that is that it was converting i think the number is like it still converts at 17 percent, which is not that bad actually but i i had the feeling that it could be way better if i reduced all the noise you know and that's something that i learned from experience of watching other creators you know again with the stealing thing um i start right. I, di I did a list of 30 newsletters that that i i like and basically i started looking at the landing pages of each and most of them were like super simple landing, super simple landing pages with just like headline, sub headline, uh, subscription button, and that's it. You know, nothing else. No footer, no header, nothing. It's just like right. you can you can only leave your email or leave the page. You know, that's the two options. Right. And I tried to replicate that. I did like another another page, and if people want to check it, it's like thestillclub.com slash join. You know, that's my other landing page right now. And that one is converting at 30% right now. So, you know, that's almost like a two plus increase with 
actually removing stuff instead instead of adding more. And <laughs> right. I, I, I think that's a really interesting lesson for for us as creators. Uh, and that 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 was like my you know my my observations from seeing what others do again you know stealing, uh, mm-hmm. see what works and try to apply to to myself, and it's working. So yeah, you know, one more yeah. one more example that yeah. stealing works. Right, right. Yeah, I think they call that a squeeze page, right? Yeah. Where you're you're squeezing people down to to just one form element and one button. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's awesome. So, okay, so when people sign up for the the Steel Club, how how long is your welcome sequence? So right now, I'm actually not that long. It's just one email right now. <laughs> is it okay? Yeah, and is this is something that is top priority for me because I do want to have like an, an, a welcome sequence, even if it's just like three or four emails, because I do want mm-hmm. to onboard people more into like the stealing uh, f- philosophy, if you want to call it, and right. and all of that. Yeah. So uh, definitely, it's working. It's a work in progress because I feel that I'm missing a lot of you know I I'm I'm missing a lot of opportunities to build more trust with, with people who join the list by not having like a welcome sequence actually. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, there's so much to create. There's so much to, for your attention to be pointed at that, mm. uh, you know, there's just always so much to do. Yeah. So much. Now I, I know that you have, um, a, another area that you like to talk about where it's like picking your niche. Mm. And I know there are very different opposing uh, views on this. So when, when people come to you and they're like, I just, I want to start, but I don't know how to go. Where, how do you point them? What direction do you point them? In? Yeah. One of the main questions I get is like, you know, what, what niche should I pick? You know, because the niche thing is like super extended, you know, I think. And right. what, what I always say is like the problem with many people is that they niche by topic. Mm-hmm. I think that picking a topic, you know, email marketing for, you know, e-commerce, for, for example, that's your niche. And for me, I prefer to niche by transformation or what I like to call the red pill, you know, on the matrix in the movie, there is this scene where, you know, Morpheus does like the blue pill, red pill thing. And if you take the blue pill, it's like staying in that imaginary world, you know, where on the, on the simulation, let's say, but if you take the red pill, you are, you suddenly learn the, the truth about, about the world and all of that. And what I say is that you should offer that red pill to your audience. You know, you, you should have like that one thing that you believe. And that should be your mission. Mm-hmm. And that, that one thing is like a transformation, the transformation that you do for your audience. In my case, right. it's like, you know, you are a creator. But the transformation I help you go with is, it will be, I help you grow your audience and monetize your content. And that encapsulates so many topics that if I wanted to niche, if I wanted to niche like on newsletters, that's fine. But growing an audience go, goes beyond newsletters. You know, it goes to like social media. It goes to creating content, all of that. And monetizing your content goes beyond digital products it could be like digital products but also services also like you know uh, <clears throat> when you niche by transformation um you have way more topics to talk about but still everything falls under that that transformation right. umbrella you know so that's why i say the the red yeah. pill idea i think it's way better because some creators sometimes they feel trapped by their niche you know they feel trapped like you know because i only talk right. about email marketing i cannot talk about anything else because then people will you know <laughs> they will not pay attention or whatever They'll yeah, fail. exactly. And I get yeah. the concern and it kind of happens sometimes, but for me, it's better if you do like, you just, just say that what transform, you know, who, who is your target audience? What transformation do you help them achieve? That's your red pill. You know, that's your thing. And the right. ways that you get there can be email marketing, but they can be many other topics too. You know, as long as you are driving them to that promised destination, um, it will work, you know? So figuring that out is, Everybody is something wins. that. I always tell people like the first thing you should do is figure this thing out because once, once you get clarity on that, the rest will come so easily, you know, what to build, what content to create, you know, like all of that. And, you know, I'm saying this, but it's not that hard. It's not that difficult to do, but at the same time, it's not that easy. You know, you need to sit down and think about it. You know, it's not something yeah. that will come on the spot, but I think it's an exercise uh, worthwhile doing. Well, and a lot of times you, ha- you have to really experiment and you have to go out and create and kind of figure out you know, what are you good yeah. at providing that transformation for? What are you good at communicating with? What, what people resonate with you on? And yeah. so I love the way you, you articulate that because I think it's easy to miss a lot of times. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to move into our final thoughts. But before we do that, if people are interested in connecting more with you, where, where would you send them? Yeah, so obviously the stickclub.com, that's where my newsletter is. Or the, if they want to see like the good landing page, it's like <laughs> slash join. <laughs> Uh, and then mainly right now I'm hanging, hanging mostly on Twitter. 
So at, at Alex U T W. So that's like L L U L L T W. Um, yeah. And I'm always, you know, my DMs are always open. So send me a DM, send me an email. If you have any questions, struggles, whatever, always happy to help. Awesome. So, okay. I, we need to, we need to steal three things from you. So if you were going to outline three takeaways that people could, could take today, what would those be? Yeah. So the first one, uh, that's my kind of my mantra is like, other people are not competition. They are inspiration, you know, like take inspiration and from everyone, don't see them as competition. Try to understand what works for them and try to steal whatever you can. You know, that would be, I guess, my, my first thing. Then the second one, uh, what we talk, you know, treat your profile as a professional profile, uh, because that, that does make a difference with, with many, you know, uh, as a trust building factor. And I think a lot of creators kind of overlook that. Uh, it's easy to overlook. And I would say the last one is probably uh, the red pill thing. That's a, one of my favorites too. It's just like, if you feel stuck with your content and all of that, try to think about it more, more from the standpoint of like a transformation. What transformation are you helping your audience make? Um, and I think that if you get clarity with that, it's just way, the game becomes easier, you know, by doing that. So definitely those three things are, I would say my, my core, my core things that I want, I would like people to, to stay with. Thanks so much for being a part of the show. Now, one of the easiest ways that we can stay in touch is that if you're watching on YouTube, please like this episode and subscribe to the channel if you'd like. And if you're listening to the audio version, rating on your favorite podcast app would mean the absolute world to you. So I'm Craig Shoemaker, and I'll see you again here soon on the Leverage 3 Podcast.